Good evening, everyone. I'm Rafe Schaefer with the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy. We're delighted to welcome you to tonight's webinar, Aquatic Mammals of New York City with Brooklyn-based author Thomas Hines. Thomas's fascinating work has been featured in publications such as Scientific American, Sierra Club, The All, Gothamist, Atlas Obscura, and Untapped New York. His newest book, Wild City, A Brief History of New York City and 40 Animals, can be purchased from his website, thomashinesbooks.com, or at many local independent bookstores. We're so pleased to have him here. Thomas, thank you for leading tonight's webinar. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I'm happy to talk about New York City wildlife at any point, but Brooklyn Bridge Park is so close to my heart, so close to my home. Uh, and I was just there an hour ago running as the, my last pre-show thing in this frigid cold, but I, I, you can't tear me away from Brooklyn Bridge Park. So I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And awesome. um, I can, uh, I, if you want to wait a few minutes, we can wait, but I can also get started and share my screen. Whatever sure. You I just want to remind our audience that the webinar is also being live streamed on YouTube and a recording will remain there for later access. Uh, we want to ask that you all please stay muted until the discussion portion of the workshop, at which point you're welcome to participate via video and microphone. You're also welcome to utilize the moderated chat box and to ask our speaker questions at any time you want during the talk. We'll also be checking the YouTube chat box, but please be aware there's a slight delay in streaming there. Before we begin the program, we want to acknowledge that Brooklyn Bridge Park is on unceded land, which was stolen at catastrophic human and environmental costs from the Muncie Lenape and Canarsie peoples. We keep these First Nations and their past, present, and future members in mind as leaders in our field and the rightful owners of this land. Thank you. Uh, with that, Thomas, I'm, I'm more than happy to turn it over for you. Thank you again for joining us. I'm, oh, I'm so absolutely. excited to hear from you. Thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate you putting uh, the website in the chat. Uh, you, like you, like you mentioned, it, you can get it at most local stores. I'd like to uh, also uh, suggest bookshop.org, um, which will place you with your nearest uh, independent bookstore. Or the, of course, there's always the GoFundMe for Jeff Bezos' next uh, uh, rocket ship. Also, the the link that I put in the chat. This has really nothing to do with New York City wildlife, but it's Girl Scout cookie season, and um, I was made aware of this troop uh, that's basically comprised of uh, girls in New York City homeless uh, shelter system. So if you're going to get these cookies, this is a great place to get it. Um, with that uh, aside, I will <clears throat> begin to uh, share my screen and we can get started. Okay. So um, again, my name is Thomas Hines. Uh, I am so thrilled to be here uh, speaking with you virtually uh, as hosted by Brooklyn Bridge Park. I say to people all the time, uh, if you spend as much time in Brooklyn Bridge Park as, as I do, you might uh, also write a book about New York City wildlife. Um, as you can see from the cover, um, for those of you who haven't read the book, it is Brief History of New York City and 40 Animals. So it's really uh, 40 uh, separate chapters, uh, 44 if you include the introductions and the conclusions. And um, I like to say it's sort of an incidental history of New York. As you can also see from the cover, um, this was illustrated by Kath Nash, who I was very lucky to work with. Um, she's an illustrator now based in Los Angeles, but she was in Brooklyn when we worked on this. And uh, you'll be seeing her illustrations uh, throughout the book. I, I was thinking on, on my way over here, our, our, when I was running in Brooklyn Bridge Park earlier, that I actually have three illustrations in the book uh, from the, a vantage point of a different place in Brooklyn Bridge Park, but alas, they're not uh, aquatic mammals, so you'll have to Pick up the book and see if you can spot them. Uh, tonight, though, we are going to discuss the four aquatic mammals uh, that we have featured in the book. Uh, top left, we have uh, the beaver. Uh, to the beaver's right, we have the humpback whale. Uh, down in the left-hand corner, we have dolphins. And uh, rounding us out, uh, the fourth mammal we'll be discussing tonight is the harbor seal. Um, we're going to start, though, with beavers. Uh, because in my estimation, beavers are probably the most important animal uh, in New York City history. Uh, you know, you really can't write a book or even talk about New York City's relationship to wildlife without touching on a few animals. Uh, beavers are definitely one of them, oysters, pigeons, things like that. Um, but I would put the, oyster, uh, the beavers as, as the most important. Um, <clears throat> And one of, the, uh, one of the main things that I did for, for research on this was to read this wonderful book 
uh, that covers a lot of the early history of the European history of, uh, of, of New York City, because of course this is uh, stolen land, this is Lenape land. And I, I try to make some mentions of that throughout the book that, you know, and just in conversation, I like to say people, there's this funny tension between New Yorkers, like I'm a native New Yorker, you're not a native New Yorker. Uh, but unless you're uh, a Lenape, uh, Native American, uh, you're an immigrant like everybody else here. Um, so this is, anyway, about this book, it's a great book. It, it, it covers a lot of ground, but it also covers about how beavers were here in abundance. And in this book, uh, The Island at the Center of the World, uh, Russell Shorto writes that the fur trade was the colony's entire reason for being. And he describes the beaver felts that were uh, made from, uh, uh, excuse me, the fashion items that were made from beaver felts as a status symbol uh, almost a necessity throughout Europe. So it's meaning as far back as even the 1630s, New York City was influencing uh, the global fashion industry. By the 1600s, by the late 1600s, just later that century, uh, according to Science Daily, over 80,000 beaver skins were exported annually from North America and often right through Manhattan. It was bad for business, but it was great for, uh, it was bad for beavers, but great for business. And of course, that's a, uh, that's a, a dynamic we see over and over again in New York City's history uh, with its wildlife. <clears throat> and uh, this is just a map from 1635 that a father and son made. Um, they made this as part of a larger atlas, but as you can see, beavers are sort of represented on here uh, at this, in this old rudimentary uh, um, a map of, of, the, of the Dutch colony. Um, this is a uh, map of the New York, excuse me, a flag of New York City, the, the, the seal says 1625, but I think this flag was actually incorporated or introduced uh, in 1915, because that would have been 15 years after the boroughs all united and became the greater New York that we know today. Um, but if we take a closer look, the map doesn't have, uh, excuse me, the map, the flag doesn't have just one beaver on it. Uh, it actually has two, as well as an eagle. Um, and then, you know, as we think about New York City's history uh, with, as, a, as a European um, colony, it really starts uh, in lower Manhattan and sort of moves out in all directions and obviously moves up as well as we'll see later. Um, but in that early, early Dutch settlement, uh, you know, no, no farther north than Wall Street, <clears throat> uh, Beaver Street is one of the original streets downtown. Um, so you can see that this was sort of on people's mind and there are these, these uh, sort of hidden uh, Beaver references throughout the city. The City College's mascot, as an example, Benny the Beaver. Um, and then my favorite is the uh, Astor Place uh, subway station, which of course has tons of beavers uh, throughout it. And I had been to this subway station probably a thousand times before I realized that. Um, but that's kind of the, the thing about New York City wildlife is when you start looking around, you, you begin to notice all of these little uh, hints and, and things uh, leading to towards that history. Of course, Astor Place was named for John Jacob Astor, who would eventually be known as the richest man in America. And that was thanks originally to the fortune he made from trapping beaver. Uh, in the 1830s, however, perhaps sensing things to come, uh, Astor divested entirely from the beaver game and moved his money into real estate. And soon uh, the rest of New York City would follow in this trend. And by that, I mean, they would transition away from a tangible economy based on natural resources to something more abstract and speculative. Um, this is around the same time that we were, uh, you know, removing pigs, uh, pig farms and things like that from what is now Midtown, uh, but we're creating these sort of abstract um, natural settings like Central Park. So we really were moving uh, in, in a lot of transition in a number of ways during the 19th century, and I think this was just one of them. Um, <clears throat> and John Jacob Astor, of course, was, uh, you know, a, a funny guy. He um, the, the neighborhood in Queens is named after him as is the uh, uh, a town out in Oregon. And when he, I guess the town in Oregon happened second. And when he found out about that, he said, well, they named a town for me in Oregon and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna go there. They named a town for me in Queens and I won't even go there either. So I guess if you're the richest man on earth, uh, you let people come to you. <clears throat> um, and of course the New York City beaver uh, population just could not sustain that level of hunting, that level of trapping, that level of commerce. And so um, around this time, the beavers completely you know, disappeared from New York City and the beaver trade, you know, like, uh, like we were talking about, New York City's economy really transitioned into some of these more intangible things like finance and real estate. Um, but beavers are an interesting animal outside of New York. Uh, the first thing you can see here is that they're kind of uh, adorable. 
Um, but they're also engineers. Uh, beavers obsessively build dams to trap water. Uh, if they hear running water, uh, AKA a breach in their dam, they'll, they'll stop what they're doing and set out to fix it. Beavers can swim uh, up to 15 miles per hour and they can hold their breath for up to 15 minutes at a time. This is a slide, uh, you know, this is just from your basic like, this has nothing really to do with New York City, but um, this, is the, this is the impact of a beaver on an ecosystem. You can kind of see the way that they're creating a wetland uh, and, and sort of spreading the water table around to reach more plants. Um, wetlands, of course, are both incredibly helpful and increasingly rare. So, uh, you know, they, they sustain all kinds of mosquito life, uh, excuse me, insect life, which brings birds, which brings other predators. It's, they really are uh, a keystone uh, species. Um, you know, beavers have a need, as you said, to engineer their surroundings. And if that sounds familiar, um, you know, that's because we do it too. Uh, this is a, a picture from uh, a great book uh, by Eric Sanderson at the Wildlife Conservation Society. It's called Manahatta. And uh, it shows how New York City uh, would have looked uh, on that day in 1609 when Henry Hudson uh, sailed up the Verrazano Narrows and sort of the European uh, reign and, and sort of degradation of the, of, of the, of the uh, ecosystem uh, took place. Uh, so this is just a side by side. This is from the cover of the book, but this is a little bit more of a detailed look about how Manhattan would have looked. Um, a lot of interesting things going on here. Uh, there's a lot less of New York of Manhattan. It's about <clears throat> three quarters of the size that it is today. Uh, if you look, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but down here in what is basically City Hall, uh, we see the Collect Pond, which was a 50-acre pond, freshwater source. Uh, in New York City up until I think like the 1820s. Um, I've got a chapter about it in the book because there was a, a legendary monster that lived there is a whole other story. But um, you can see it's a lot, uh, as a lot different. And I think as we talk about New York City and beavers and just in wildlife in general, it's important to have a look at how New York City looked uh, in the 1600s. Um, there was some thinking that uh, had the US been settled by the Europeans west to east, that this may have been left as a national park uh, because it actually is very ecologically special. Uh, as an example, Yellows uh, Yellowstone National Park has 2.2 million acres and has 66 ecosystems, which is a very diverse, uh, ecologically speaking, uh, plot of land. But Manhattan had only 2,200 acres and had 55 ecosystems. So it's almost not enough to say that it would have been a national park. Um, it's almost that New York City could have been the jewel of the national park system, which is kind of like a hard thing to wrap your head around, uh, but it's true. And also, uh, you know, ultimately the reason that New York City grew to be this massive colossal metropolis, you know, was because we had this incredible natural, natural advantage. And we'll get more into that with the harbor later uh, with some of the other animals, but it's just to kind of give you a sense of how things looked. Um, as we focus back on the beavers, uh, I'm gonna show you a similar map <clears throat> of how the Bronx looked uh, way back when. And you see the, the uh, western side of, of the Bronx is sort of these rolling hills. Uh, and then right down the middle of the borough here uh, is the Bronx River, um, which is really where the beaver story uh, takes place uh, nowadays. Um, the Bronx River is uh, the only freshwater river in New York City. It is uh, 23 miles and runs from Westchester County uh, down to the Long Island Sound, basically cuts uh, uh, the Bronx in half. Um, this is a, a blurry map of, <laughs> of how it cuts through the city today. And that green space in the middle, of course, is Bronx Park, which nobody calls it that. We call it the Bronx Zoo and the Botanical Gardens. But when it was originally proposed in 1888, this is how, how it looked. Um, and of course, the river runs uh, right through that as well. Um, but as we have done uh, pretty consistently as a people, and as certainly as New Yorkers, uh, we have um, ruined our ecosystem in a number of ways, and the Bronx River was not uh, uh, exempt from that. Um, so there were a lot of tanneries along the shore of it. It was used as, as mills, and, and people would just generally put your trash and your human waste directly in the river. That would seem like a, an open sewer. Uh, was better than it being, uh, you know, having it float downstream to the great big Long Island Sound and the great Atlantic Ocean uh, seemed like a better idea than having it in your backyard. So this is, this is just how people operated. This wasn't unique, obviously, to the Bronx River. 
<clears throat> um, cleanup efforts of the river, uh, I was surprised to hear, began in earnest uh, in 1907 with the construction of the Bronx River Parkway. Now, you say that now and you say, how would building a highway <laughs> clean up an area? It comes with so much pollution and, and noise and trash and, and poor air quality and all this other stuff. But this was the thinking then, you know, you put these parkways, uh, you know, to, to connect the urban dwellers to these places of leisure. Um, the other major innovation uh, in this 1907 upgrade uh, is that they built a sewer pipe. So the so the, the, the river that had kind of been consistently polluted since the Europeans arrived to the early 1900s, sort of given a chance to, to get back on its feet. But of course, we were never, we were not done polluting uh, and things actually kind of got worse uh, for the Bronx River, for the Bronx in general, and for New York City in general uh, in the next half century. And I think that's transcends ecology and environment, right? I mean, that this is, uh, the 1970s were kind of considered New York's dark days. This corresponds with the deindustrialization de of the urban centers. This, you know, corresponds with uh, un, uh, white flight and a number of other things that kind of conspired uh, against New York City and also federal, uh, I think, negligence. I would say uh, sort of that that forward to the city, drop dead, uh, uh, you know, scenarios where the city went bankrupt, and and that showed in a million of ways, and that of course showed environmentally in the Bronx River. Uh, which really um, kind of got trashed. This is a picture of the kid uh, looking at the Bronx River from 1970. Um, <clears throat> as I said, you know, and I, and I talk about this a lot in the book, this, that there, there's these important dates that really stand out and really hold up this story of New York City's wildlife. And the first date is 1609, because that's the year the Europeans arrived and sort of this cause and effect really took shape. And as we know, when we see all around us in New York, it really uh, amplified and industrialized. Um, but the late 70s, uh, specifically around 1972, uh, I would say is another turning point. I would say that's the low point. Uh, not again, not just for New York City, not just for the Bronx, but for, you know, this is the age of burning rivers in, in Milwaukee and in, and in uh, Cleveland and other places. Um, but this is when the EPA was founded. This is when the Clean Water Act was founded, this Clean Air Act. So there is some, the first Earth Day, there's some sort of awakening. And obviously these are, this was a, not a light switch that we can just turn on, but advocacy uh, really began to take shape all around the city. In the Bronx, uh, the Bronx River Alliance uh, began in, I think, 1974. They're founded by Ruth Annenberg. Um, in 2001, uh, they used to be called the Bronx River Restoration Group. They morphed into their present uh, Bronx River Alliance in 2001. They really spearheaded and continue to spearhead uh, the cleanup of uh, and the stewardship of the, of the city's only freshwater uh, river. And they connect communities uh, to the river, as we'll see in a moment, and, uh, you know, through cleanups and education. And they're just, a, they're a great organization. And if there's one thing you take away from this book is that like the Bronx River Alliance, like Brooklyn Bridge Park, Billion Oyster Project, Wild Bird Fund. I mean, there are people really doing great work who have who have been doing great work uh, since that low point. You know, uh, the, the the nadir in the in the early seventies, late sixties. Uh, another champion of the Bronx River is uh, former uh, House Representative Jose Serrano, who uh, worked to secure tens of millions of dollars to the river's cleanup. And the, boy, did they clean it up! Um, Approximately, I've read that there was about 675,000 tons of trash, uh, including 30,000 old tires and 89 dumped cars uh, pulled out of this relatively small river. Uh, it's not exactly the Mississippi. This is a 23-mile river. Um, and I, uh, I'm not a math major, but I, I, I plugged this into a calculator. And 89 dumped cars uh, across 23 miles is about a, a car every quarter of a mile. So that's just... Uh, it, it was really uh, kind of the worst of New York City. It's <laughs> well, you know, or maybe you say that about the Gowanus or, or the Newtown Creek. We have a lot of candidates for like deeply polluted places <laughs> and ecological negligence, but the Bronx River was definitely one of them. But this was also happening with cleanups and work. Um, and then, you know, slowly things started to improve. And I think this, this is a, I like this picture because it really illustrates. Uh, you know, still a trashed river, but we see some, we see a heron returning. Uh, but the real coup de grace was in 2008 when, as I like to say, the damnedest thing happened. Uh, a beaver returned to New York City in 2008. And it was the first beaver uh, 
that wasn't in like a zoo um, in 200 years. And uh, it was a, a major moment in New York City uh, wildlife. I actually remember reading about that story, I guess it was 13 years ago. And when I first had this idea for this book, I was like, that return beaver, this is like the prodigal beaver. This is this great story. Um, and it really, as I like, I think I say in the book, um, these beavers are the, the buck toothed vindication of, of, of environmentalism and advocacy and, and kind of proof that it works. Um, you know, if, if this disgusting dirty river can be turned around to the point that a beaver of its own volition decides to make a, a go of it there, um, that says a lot about what we can do in other places. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of parts in the book, and we talk a lot, a lot about wildlife, but the book also really talks about these wild places. Um, you know, I've been out in the Bronx River a bunch, uh, didn't see any uh, beavers, but they're, they're these great, very special places. And I hope uh, when people read the book, that one of the takeaways is to, to know about these little sort of surprising pockets of, of, of nature throughout the city and the Bronx River is definitely one of them. Um, so these are the two beavers. The second beaver came, I think, two years later. The first one uh, was named Jose the Beaver in, name, in honor of uh, Representative Serrano, who, who had secured the tens of millions of dollars. And the second beaver, uh, they put to a vote and was named Justin Beaver uh, for the Canadian singer, which is, which is a great honor. Um, and, uh, you know, I just take this moment to kind of shout out the Bronx River Alliance a little bit more and uh, encourage anybody uh, who's interested to join them for one of their uh, paddles. This is their, this is a picture from their flotilla, which is their annual event, but they do this most weekends. Um, and it's, it's, you know, relatively uh, affordable. I think in some cases, you know, it's on a sliding scale, they'll help people who maybe can't afford to get out there, but, and they're, you know, a big part of their mission is connecting the community to the river. So there's not like a, uh, a gateway to a gatekeeper to this. This is something that everybody can hopefully do. And um, it's just an amazing way to showcase this, this river. And, you know, I've lived in New York a long time. I had no idea that this was this sort of this winding ribbon of, of, of greenery was, was in the middle of the Bronx of all places. And it's really right in the middle. It's not tucked away in some corner. I mean, it's uh, really special. And these are some of my pictures uh, from when I went um, five or six years ago at this point. Um, like I said, I didn't see any beavers, but I just couldn't believe what I did see, which was this, I, you know, I felt like I could have been in the Adirondacks. I could have been a million miles away, but I, I wasn't. I was, I was right in the middle of New York City. And as you can see, there's still some, some, uh, some legacy pollution that, that's still happening here. But, you know, this is, this is a process. And I think the more people that get out there and experience these places, uh, and that don't just view it as these abstract rivers, but you know this beautiful place where you can go with your kids and sort of kayak and have a great day. I think people will be more prone uh, to protect it, and I think that's that's the case with wildlife too. And and kind of the point of this book really is to kind of get people excited about uh, the surprising wildlife that's here in the hopes that they'll protect it. Um, just one last picture uh, from the surprisingly bucolic uh, Bronx River, and. Uh, you know they're working to make a greenway up and down, uh, <clears throat> up and down the river uh, as as it connects to the sound. This is um, I find this to be an interesting park. It's Concrete Plant Park, and that is not named after you know someone named Concrete Plant. That this was an active concrete plant uh, until sort of recently. Um, and you know this there is a legacy of industry, and this is an interesting way that they've sort of incorporated that into this uh, next. Uh, phase of the park's life. And, and here we are talking at Broken Bridge, of course, is like the, the internet, you know, like the, the gold standard for that kind of transformation. Um, what's funny about this too, is that there's actually, a, I think an active concrete plant like across the river from this. So it's, it's really like still uh, a process. This is not uh, completely done. This is Starlight Park, uh, which is I think north of uh, the concrete plant park, but south of the zoo. So they really are trying to, you know, string this together and, and make this a, a real, a real green space uh, for the Bronx. And it's just, you know, it's, it's worth checking out uh, if you get the chance. Um, and then this is a, sort of like an update uh, on the beaver. I think this happened after I, I sent in my final edits for the book. So I don't think this is in it, but this is a beaver in Swindler's Cove in Manhattan. Uh, <clears throat> you know, th uh, this used to be an, an illegal dumping ground uh, that I believe NYRP, New York's New York Restoration Project, um, Founded by Bette Miller, the greatest people, 
that there, this is one of their like jewel cleanup sites. And here, here's a beaver showing up. Um, and then uh, this is something I, I find funny. Uh, this is a, a headline from the New York Post uh, lamenting the return of beavers <laughs> um, and uh, you know, using words uh, in the article. Uh, they use words like invasion and destruction. Uh, you know, it's 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 another funny thing about wildlife. Uh, and I think Staten Island bears the brunt of this in a lot of times. But uh, it's fun to think about wildlife in the abstract. But it's it's less fun when they're you know deer running across the Staten Island Expressway. And I and I don't mean any. Uh, I'm not trying to deride Staten Island's position on this. Like they really do have a deer problem. They really do have a beaver problem. And it is, it is a problem. It's like, we got to figure out a way to balance uh, wildlife with our urban uh, uh, ecosystem. But I think it's obviously very possible. And um, even if the New York Post uh, doesn't think so. So we're going to move on now. Uh, to one of my favorite animals in the book, uh, the humpback whale, uh, the original uh, New York giant. Um, what I <laughs> sort of cornerly like about this is that I grew up uh, around here in the suburbs. I grew up on the water uh, and the movie uh, Free Willy was a, a very popular movie when I was growing up. And I thought, well, I live next to a bunch of dirty water, uh, full of pollution and probably dead bodies and no whale would ever swim in New York City. And I am so pleasantly and happily wrong about that. Uh, and, and, and talk about tons of proof that uh, environmental cleanup can work. Well, here you go. Um, so uh, we talked about New York City earlier. We talked, you know, it really is more than uh, Manhattan. And we talked about this natural advantage that New York City had that I, I really don't think other cities have. And I think that uh, what is really the top of that list besides all those beavers and, and, you know, these interesting ecosystems is the harbor. The harbor is super protective. It's super unique. Um, you have, uh, you know, the tip of Manhattan, seven nautical miles away from the Atlantic Ocean. It's protected by these huge barrier islands, uh, broad navigable rivers. We had half the world's oysters uh, in this in this uh, in this harbor uh, in the 16, you know, by the 1600s before we came in. That's a whole other story. But um, the New York Harbor really is this special place. And uh, and when we kind of pull back uh, and look at it like this, we see if we really are in this unique. A series of islands, this unique thing. You can kind of tell how it could have been a national park. Um, uh, the other thing about uh, New York City's growth that we were talking about earlier, how we kind of went the other direction and built this city, uh, is that we also built it out. Um, I've talked about this slide for like, I don't know, like as long as I've been working on this book. Um, it's recently been in the news that someone proposed uh, running Manhattan another 1,700 acres so that it would uh, swallow up Governor's Island. But it, it's sadly nothing new. I mean, we've, we've already added, uh, by some estimates, uh, three Manhattans worth uh, uh, of, of landfill uh, to New York Harbor. Um, and Manhattan itself, is, as we alluded to earlier, is about 25% bigger. Uh, than it used to be. So it's just a, you know a, a, another way that we've really changed uh, the landscape and the water flow and the habitat um, that once was very productive in a non-commerce uh, kind of way. Uh, and you know it's the same story with the beavers. The Bronx River was not the only place that we uh, polluted to to high hell. Um, this is uh, I think the Newtown Creek in the 1930s. Um, you know, New York City Harbor used to be so dirty that you could uh, sail your ship through and any parasite or, or shipworm or mollusk or barnacle would just die and clean your boat. Uh, and um, shipworms and, uh, have their own chapter in the book. And that's also a separately an interesting story. But just to illustrate, like, the way that New York City had really, you know, had this national, uh, this natural gem uh, and then uh, this natural wealth and kind of squandered it, you know, um, polluted the air, uh, polluted the land, polluted the water, uh, drove a bunch of species away and um, drove a bunch of people away. You know, <laughs> it wasn't just the species who didn't want to live here. Uh, it wasn't just the animals, I should say. Um, but as we said earlier, the 1970s were really uh, probably the most important, if not the most important era in New York City's wildlife story. And those hugely important uh, events were the creation of the EPA in 1970 and the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972. 
Um, now, what does that mean operationally for New York City? Well, it didn't actually mean anything until 1986. I think that's when New York City sewer systems uh, became compliant. And by that, I mean, they, they, they treat wastewater on a dry weather day. This is the dirty secret about New York, of course, is that when it's a wet weather day, uh, our rainwater mixes with sewage and overflows into the water. And it's just like a disgusting thing that happens. And there's, there's sometimes nothing we can do about recreating the sewer, but there are things we can do. But anyway, so even when we got compliant in 1986, we still had a lot of water uh, and waste that we weren't treating that was finding its way into the water. But things did begin to improve. And I don't mean to be you know, Debbie Downer about it, but things did begin to improve. Um, as far as the whales are concerned, uh, a very important event uh, in their New York City story uh, took place in 2012 uh, with this Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, I think they met somewhere in Maryland or something. And they decided that the allowable catch uh, for a fish called menhaden uh, should be reduced by 25%. Now, uh, what is a menhaden? This is a menhaden. Uh, you may also know them as bunker fish. Um, you probably will never see menhaden on a menu uh, at a restaurant, um, but you will see uh, fish oil supplements and things of that nature uh, are menhaden, and they are fished on an, in, like an industrial uh, uh, level uh, by publicly traded companies and, and things like that. Uh, including uh, Omega Protein. Uh, I forget, their, I think I put their stock ticker in the book, but it doesn't matter. But a uh, publicly traded company, uh, of course, was like, this is unnecessary. Uh, we can't reduce the number of catch. Like, it's bad, you know, it's bad for business. Um, uh, incidentally, their stock price has gone up since 2012, but whatever, make of that if you will. Um, and this is uh, a picture of how the fish oil is, is, is transferred. Um, this is, I think Omega Protein doing some fishing of Manhattan. So you really see, I mean, they're pulling a lot of fish out of the water. Um, so reducing this by 25% meant that there were more Manhattan and lunging in uh, to take advantage of that has been the humpback whales. And, you know, we were saying earlier, like things don't really happen overnight. This kind of did happen overnight. I mean, as soon as there were more Manhattan uh, available on the Atlantic coast, uh, maybe in concert with cleaner waters that have been, you know, underway for 30 years. Uh, it's sort of created this uh, perfect opportunity for humpback whales um, to, to come back into New York Harbor uh, as a hunting ground. Um, and the person who uncovered this hypothesis, proposed this hypothesis, is uh, Paul Susuerta, who I actually met the, for the first time at Brooklyn Bridge Park um, a couple of years ago. He was giving a talk on whales uh, in the harbor. And, and Paul, uh, just to, you know, if you do read the book, Paul's quoted in like five or six chapters. I mean, he is, he's the guy. Paul uh, was the uh, curator of the New York Aquarium uh, for like 20 years. He had decided to retire, uh, but he kept hearing all of these reports about whales uh, being in, in New York City. And I said to him, you know, when we talked, <clears throat> one of the times we talked, I said, but, you know, could they have been there before? And, he, and he was, his point was, I was the curator of the New York City Aquarium. I would have known <laughs> if there were humpback whales, which is a fair point. Um, and so he, he, uh, he declined retirement and, and started uh, uh, the nonprofit uh, uh, citizen science group uh, known as Gotham Whale. And, you know, along with Bronx River Alliance, along with Gotham Coyote, and, and uh, fresh, there's just a, another one of these uh, amazing groups created by New Yorkers uh, out there, you know, advocating and educating um, for a wilder New York City. And, and that, that, again, not to go to a side, but that was one of the nicest things about writing this book is, is, is seeing all these New Yorkers who kind of don't fit the bill of what we think New Yorkers are being these sort of rabid environmental advocates. Uh, it, it was, it, you know, kind of refreshing. Um, so Paul started uh, Gotham Whale around 2011, uh, no, 2000, after he retired, um, uh, around 2013, I think. And he used to call it whale watching adventure cruises because the real adventure was whether or not you were going to see a whale. Um, but fortunately, uh, 
more whales started coming every year. Um, I think at one point it told me that it like it doubled every year. And then at the fifth year, it was bigger than all the four years combined. Uh, the, uh, the cruises go out on this boat. It's called the American Princess. Um, and just looking at the map of New York City again, this is uh, Floyd Bennett Field, uh, which used to be Barron Island. Uh, and you take the Marine Park Bridge right here across to Jacob Reese Park, Jacob Reese Landing and the boat leaves from right here. So, you know, this is, this is Manhattan all the way up here. So you're kind of, you know, getting yourself out into the Atlantic Ocean a little bit, which is technically, you know, right here is still technically New York Harbor. And that's where a lot of these whales were starting to be seen off the coast of the Rockaways, off the coast of Coney Island, off the coast of Staten Island. Um, <clears throat> kind of the places you would expect to see whales. Um, but they, again, they, 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 they started to increase their frequency. We saw three in 2011. And last year, uh, there were 300 different whales uh, spotted. And they know they're different uh, based on their fluke, um, which we'll see a picture of a fluke. It's the tail. It's basically like a fingerprint. Um, and that's one of the things that Paul and Gotham Whale do is they, they catalog all of these sightings with photographs and you know, it, uh, coordinate citizen science um, to, to get a sense of, you know, what's out there, because obviously whales are not easy to photograph. Um, this is uh, from 2016. You know, I was, I remember I was working, I was thinking about writing the book, I had kind of written some chapters, and this, this happened. And I was like, this is, this is really like, New York City wildlife is a real thing. This is uh, taken from near uh, the George Washington Bridge, I want to say. Um, uh, it's basically on the Upper West Side anyway. I mean, that's north of Midtown. Um, this is a humpback whale swimming uh, in the Hudson. And, and as we talked about, you can see the, the fluke being a little bit like a fingerprint. I mean, you can tell how it's not a precise shape. So it, that is unique uh, to this whale. Um, and this is really exciting. And this is, uh, if you might remember the illustration from Calf uh, that we looked at at the beginning of the whale section, um, this is basically what happened and you know, it, it, it really was there with the Empire State Building and everything behind it. It's, it was this really very special thing. Um, and uh, this is one a little bit more recently, I think this is 2020, uh, and that's Brooklyn Bridge Park uh, right there in the background. So these are not um, super common. I would say it's maybe one a year, but it's up from none a year. I mean, this never happened in my lifetime. Uh, and it's happening more and more. And, you know, New York is a really busy harbor. You know, you got Staten Island Ferry, you got tugboats and barges and New York City Ferry and, and, and tons of, of personal uh, craft and cruises and things like that. So, you know, this is another one of these things. This is the aquatic version of deer running across the expressway. Like, we gotta, we want whales, we want our water to be clean enough that humpback whales want to swim in them. But we need to be aware of that and probably make some concessions. And, and, I, and I think it's ultimately like a very good sign that whales are back. I think it means that there's a healthy harbor. We live around this water. We're obviously not using it for like drinking water or anything like that, but you don't want to live near diseased water. You want to live near a clean habitat. And uh, I think whales are a real uh, big indication that we're on the right track. And this is just some other pictures. I think of the same whale uh, taken from the Brooklyn Bridge um, Point of view, and I just, I, you know, if you're somebody like me who's into New York City wildlife, I mean, you really can't ask for a better picture than uh, a humpback whale breaching in front of the Statue of Liberty. I mean, that is just all too perfect. Um, and we've seen all these pictures of the the whale's tail, and uh, just a just a quick illustration from the book uh, by Kath, just to give you a sense of how the, uh, the whole Magilla looks uh, under the water. And for you know, I I, I like to recommend a lot of other books uh, in my book. And I actually have a page uh, in the back uh, with like a dozen, two dozen other books to read. And this is one of them. It's uh, about whale song. Um, kind of just an interesting uh, thing that they have language. Uh, and maybe even if they have language, maybe that means they have culture. And uh, just rethinking um, the relative intelligence of, of these creatures and what how little we really know about them. Um, and it's it's, I think just so thrilling uh, that whales are in New York City. I just, I, I get very excited just thinking about it. Um, our next uh, aquatic mammal is the dolphin, which has also made a great comeback uh, in New York City's uh, waters. Um, you know, again, we, we've seen a lot of these guys uh, <clears throat> uh, off, the, off the coast, 
Um, this is an illustration from the book, obviously. This is another one of Kat's great uh, uh, pieces. And uh, we wanted one uh, with Coney Island in the background. And uh, you can see the steeplechase and I think the, um, uh, the, the cyclone there. Um, I you know, was probably an annoying <laughs> client of Kat because I was like, you can't just be the animal. It has to be the animal in New York City. I want to you know, I want to, I want to see some, some, <laughs> some landmarks and she was very patient. Um, uh, so generally the, the, the dolphin story is encouraging. It's along the same lines as the whale. Um, uh, given their relative size though, there are some, there have been some situations uh, where they've gotten into some situations, uh, some places uh, that they probably didn't want to end up. Uh, the one that I talk about in my book is uh, rest in peace, rest in power to uh, Mucky the dolphin who got lost in the Gowanus Canal, um, which, you know, is probably the most disgusting place in New York City. Uh, it certainly was, was before the cleanup uh, happened. Uh, they did a autopsy, necropsy on the dolphin um, that had kind of wandered in there and died. And afterwards, they wanted to see what had happened. And they think that the dolphin was probably... Um, sick uh, before it got to the canal. Maybe that's why it ended up in the canal. Um, but of course, uh, this EPA uh, toxic super fund uh, probably didn't help. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that this is a book about uh, wildlife, but it's also just about uh, the, this local uh, ecology. And, you know, the Gowanus Canal was the Gowanus Creek before that. And what have been the environmental ramifications of this sort of stagnant body of water and what's the plan uh you know for this you know great bit of real estate but also something you got to manage in the right way um and also i would just say about the gowanus canal and I'll, and I'll move on from it uh is that uh you know when we talk about environmentalism and we talk about cleanups and we talk about uh, regulations i think a, a big dynamic in that argument is it's too expensive uh to to do and it's bad for business but well, this has been an expensive cleanup. And uh, I would wonder if a little bit of prevention, you know, a hundred years ago, and I, it's easy to look back in hindsight and say you didn't have enough forbearance, but uh, you know, as we move ahead, uh, this is what the cleanups cost. Uh, and every once in a while, you'll have a, a dead dolphin sort of float to the surface and remind you of you know, the disgusting mess you've made around New York. And that's the Gowanus Canal, which I, I do think will have a brighter future. And there's a great group, again, uh, like, like all over New York City, the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, um, who's really trying to think very, uh, you know, um, thoughtfully <laughs> about, about the future of the area instead of just like, you know, bulldozing a, a new development in there. Like, let's, let's do this the right way. Let's, let's think about hydrology and, and where the water goes. Um, but it hasn't all been uh, Gowanus dolphins <laughs> stories. They're usually uh, out there thriving uh, swimming in pods. Here's one in the East River uh, just from earlier this year. Um, was photographed mostly by Transmitter Park up in Williamsburg. Um, but there were three of them. And of course, to get there, it had to go by Brooklyn Bridge Park. So, you know, when you're in the park, I mean, you know, you, there's a, there is increasingly a good chance that, uh, that these things are, are sort of swimming by us um, all the time. Uh, I think we're moving on. Yes. So this is our, our, our last animal of the night. Um, and this is the harbor seal. And as you can see, uh, the Verrazano Bridge is in the background because I was a very uh, consistent <laughs> client. I was like, no, it has to be there because, because the seals live on this little spit of land uh, that you see down here called Swinburne Island. Uh, with the Verrazano Narrows in, in, the, in, the, in the background. So where we are situated here, Staten Island on the left, we have Brooklyn on the right, the Arizona Narrows, of course, and the bridge uh, connect them. Off the coast uh, of Staten Island by the boardwalk here, the Father Capadano uh, boardwalk, we have Hoffman Island, and then the much smaller Swinburne Island. For discussing seals, uh, we wanna talk about Swinburne Island. Um, uh, but both of these islands are artificial. Um, Another example of New York City sort of changing its, its, its this is, uh, you know, that landfill, those three Manhattans worth of land that was added to the harbor. There's two of them, uh, or two examples of it. Um, 
and I go through this in the mosquito chapter, but it applies to the creation of Swinburne and Hoffman. There was a quarantine hospital on the uh, west coast of Staten Island uh, that if you were too sick as a arriving immigrant uh, to New York City, you were kept there. Um, this was also the age of uh, pandemics, <laughs> uh, which was something I wrote before uh, 2020. Um, uh, and I think there was a yellow fever outbreak that had killed like 1% or 2% of the city. I mean, it really just kind of like was very bad. And uh, if you can believe it, uh, immigrants were blamed uh, for it. And a group of Staten Islanders went and lit fire to the quarantine hospital. Um, and the fires could be seen from the New York Times building in Manhattan. It was called the Great Quarantine Conflagration of, I think, 1859. Uh, or no, it was earlier than that. Anyway, uh, Staten Island was like, enough with your quarantine hospital. Like, you can't put that on the island. So these two islands were, were created to serve that function. Um, and if you came to Ellis Island and you were too sick, you were sent to Hoffman or Swinburne Island uh, to either recuperate or die. Uh, and um, as immigration numbers sort of declined with an isolationist period, I think in the 1920s, World War I era, uh, the need for quarantine hospitals diminished. And so these islands were briefly used as I think training grounds for the merchant marines, but then went completely abandoned. Um, this is a, a, a clearer picture of Swinburne Island. Uh, they went completely abandoned uh, around the 60s and uh, were eventually absorbed into the Gateway National Park Recreation Area, which includes Floyd Bennett Field, which includes Sandy Hook, which includes you know loads of other Dead Horse Bay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, why Swinburne Island? Uh, well, Swinburne Island now is home to about 100 harbor seals. And Hoffman Island is, is home to none. And the simple answer is that there, it's easier to launch yourself onto one of the rocks at this island than on the other one. So that's the case. And with that same American, cruise, American Princess Cruise Line uh, that uh, Paul Cisuerta, uh hosts his whale watching uh, you know, visit, uh, uh, tours on, uh, you can also go out and see these seals and you know with the whale watching they're like yeah you'll probably see a whale and i did when i went but with the seals it's a hundred percent guarantee because they're always on this island and there are about 90 of them and um it's not the only place that they appear uh this little seal uh went all the way up the hudson river i think it was Hudson. i mean i don't know how it got there but it went all the way up uh, to Inwood. This is um, Inwood Hill Park. You can see the, the sea for Columbia there on the bluff. And it was about a year old and he was there for a little while. Uh, and they generally are just popping up uh, more and more. This is uh, uh, another one of these great New York City wildlife moments with the Verrazano and then the blurry uh, Statue of Liberty uh, in the background. And then, of course, there was even one uh, in Brooklyn Bridge Park not too long ago. This is, I, I mean, I was just here like an hour ago. Uh, this is um, Pier 2, is the kayak launch. I've only seen geese here, uh, but this is a harbor seal. Boop, a little closer. He was a cute little guy, and he was there for a few hours. And every time I'm in the park, I look for him, but he has <laughs> returned. But I think our chances are good. And uh, I think that, you know, it's wildlife is just another, another reason that we love uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park this uh, unexpected possibility uh, is, is, is available here uh, at the park. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm just noticing something on this slide, uh, and I suspected this. Uh, the photo was taken by um, uh, Heather Wolf, um, who is uh, a renowned uh, birder uh, in Brooklyn Bridge Park. She has a book called Birding at Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and since she has an awesome camera, she was there that day to also see uh, the humpback or the harbor seal. And I believe she's actually seen a humpback whale swim by as well. I know others have. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you to everybody. I know we, we moved through a lot of content uh, quickly. So I'm sorry if I breezed by anything too too fast, but it's a, it's a topic I'm very excited about. Yeah, Brooklyn Bridge Park is, a, is an institution I'm very excited about. So I, I, I really can't thank you all enough. Um, and again, the, the book is called Wild City. Uh, or on Instagram and Twitter at Wild City NYC. 
The book is for sale uh, on, on bookshop.org. And I, I think you should all buy your Girl Scout cookies uh, from Troop 6000. That's, if you have any questions, we can, uh, we can jump into that. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was yeah. super informative and interesting. Okay. Uh, I especially like the part about beavers. I had no idea that beavers were returning in such great numbers that they're considered a, a pest on Staten Island. Um, everybody, we are going to be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're going to begin the question and answer portion of the evening. Uh, you're welcome to turn your camera on if you'd like to ask the question to Thomas directly, or we could take your question in the chat. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you could use the raise hand function in the Zoom controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, so we can get to you in the order that, you, that you're interested in asking your question. We are also monitoring questions in YouTube, uh, and so you're welcome to participate there. Um, the first question that we have in the chat, um, and I know I can suggest an answer, maybe you, can, you have another idea, Thomas. Uh, do you know of any email alert? we can sign up for that will alert us to whales, dolphins, or seal sightings in New York Harbor at the time of the sighting so we can get out there and see them. Yeah. Uh, I know we can suggest a Gotham whale. Uh, yeah. They have a mailing list or social media accounts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure they post on their social media accounts as soon as uh, yeah. any sort of aquatic mammal is sighted. Uh, I was wondering if you had any other suggestions, Thomas. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's funny because Twitter is like such a terrible like uh, place of people being, you know, it's like a waste of time often. But there are like if you use Twitter right, I mean, there's some great New York City wildlife accounts out there. Gotham Whale is definitely one of them. Uh, uh, Central Park Birding or Manhattan Bird Alert uh, is a great one. Um, you know, there's a bald eagle uh, flying around Central Park Reservoir snatching seagulls out of the air like today i mean it's like it's crazy a bald eagle um wow yeah at like 79th street i mean it's crazy um and 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 uh yeah and i think wild bird fund is another wild bird fund is an interesting one because they're sort of like a dispatch service people tweet at wild bird fund like i found an injured pigeon i don't know what to do and then they kind of reply and instruct and connect people who can help the injured animal get to their their rehab facility but yeah, I mean, I think if you're, you know, like I said, or like I've discovered is that if you're interested in an animal, there's probably like a local advocacy group with a Twitter account and, uh, 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 you know, following Gotham Whale, though, I mean, they'll cover a lot of like the dolphins and seals. They'll, they'll kind of give you the whole thing. The other one I, I, I think is a great organization. They're not in here because they're not mammals, is the, um, the Maritime Animal Rescue Hospital. They're in Riverhead. And they do a lot of work with sea turtles, which I was very surprised to learn. We have a lot of like very big, very rare sea turtles that come through New York City all the time. And, and I'll just say this one quick uh, PSA. Uh, they mistake plastic bags and um, balloons for jellyfish and they eat them. And it's like a, one of, it's a, it's a very common uh, a thing that the, the turtle hospital basically responds to is, is this distress that the animals go in. So please, no balloons, please, no plastic bags in the water for the sake of the turtles. That's a great suggestion. You know, uh, <laughs> in Brooklyn Bridge Park, we do a number of uh, programs on the waterfront and we encounter jellyfish all the time. And so to think that a beloved animal like a sea turtle could mistake yeah. a, a jelly, uh, a plastic bag for jellyfish is You don't want to do that. It makes it, it makes it less abstract, right? Like this is, this is the real down, downstream effect. So yeah, it's, uh, a couple other questions from the chat. Uh, someone, Zach, is interested in underwater soundscapes in the area and wanted to know if you are aware of any uh, whale recordings that have been done in New York Harbor. Yeah, yeah, um, Gotham Whale does that. Um, and that's in the, that's in, I think it's in the book. Uh, they are monitoring um, with underwater hyd hydrophones or underwater microphones, uh, the sound that Menhaden make because they, the, his hypothesis is that the whales who are already kind of communicating and use sound is like such a major function that they're that they actually can hear the um, the menhaden and that's how they they kind of hone in on the prey. He also thinks that the whales are are telling one another uh, where the food is. Um, um, but yeah, I think in New York, Gotham whale would probably be a good resource for any kind of underwater acoustic work or what's being done in that field. Awesome. Just to circle back before we move on, uh, Liz is interested if you know of a specific area where sea turtles have been spotted uh, in the harbor. 
Yeah, uh, I was told up by flushing, like moving up through the sound. But I, I would, I would guess, like, you know, we look at that ma the map of the harbor. Like, they got to come through the um, the narrows, you know. And I think right. that like the rockaways are probably a really good uh, option. And um, I know there are terrapins in Jamaica Bay that I talk about in the book, but that's not the same thing. Uh, but I would, I, I would say for any of those. You want to see like a seal or a whale or, or the turtles are kind of harder to see, I bet. But um, I would say off the west coast of Staten Island uh, or um, basically Gateway, you know, like, yeah. you know, you know, like uh, the entrance to the city uh, across the two land masses are probably your best chance. That makes sense. I know uh, a sea turtle was found at Brooklyn Bridge Park one time. Uh, so they do venture into the harbor in, in the warmer months yeah. of the year. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, Robert is curious if you uh, can comment on the Billion Oyster Project and know anything about their progress are uh, rehabilitating oysters in the harbor. That's an organization that we work very closely with also in Brooklyn Bridge Park and is near and dear to us. And uh, curious yeah. if you have any insight onto their work. Yeah, well, like, uh, well, like a beaver, you can't, like, you can't write a book about New York City wildlife without talking about the oysters because and I would, and I, when I say the beaver are the most important animal in New York City, they beat the oyster by like this much. I mean, the oyster is crucial to understanding the history of New York, I think. And um, the Billion Oyster Project, uh, you know, I'm just gonna re recommend The Big Oyster by Mark Kurlansky because it is it is this great history of New York City through the oyster. Where his book ends, uh, or after his book ends, after he wrote it, The Billion Oyster Project was founded and it actually is really very much changing the trajectory of New York City's relationship to oysters. And they're doing that by repopulating um, I actually, I, as just a fan, I read their annual report today. <laughs> um, they uh, are gonna have a hundred million, their hundred millionth oyster uh, in the harbor this year. And um, the name Billion Oyster Project is also their goal, right? Like they wanna uh, introduce a billion oysters back into the harbor. And the idea is that one oyster uh, can clean 50 gallons of water a day. And if you put, uh, a billion oysters in the water of New York Harbor that the whole harbor could be filtered every three days. Um, wow. It was amazing. And I, I forgot what the, you know, that I sent in the final edits for my book three years ago at this point, maybe, you know, so like the number that was then was maybe 25 million. They're really making huge leaps and bounds for a hundred million this year. And I, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I guess that's 10% of their goal. I mean, like they're on yeah. their way. And I think it was like, they were at like three and a half percent of their goal when I, last check for for posterity in the book but they're amazing and uh they they i volunteered with them out on governor's island and i they build these like they call them gabions but they're like basically like condominiums that they like seed with old oyster shells and young oyster spat and uh you can go out there and and and, and build it the other thing and I, I i could do a whole hour on oysters and i have and, and i will again but <laughs> um i'll just say what's also very interesting about billion oyster project is that they are redirecting uh, at present, two million pounds of oyster shells from going to a landfill. So uh, that's a huge, you know, landfills are like a huge problem. There's a whole chapter about fresh kills uh, in the book, but just in general, like that's two million pounds that doesn't need to go into a truck and, and drive for half a day to some other state to sit, you know, like it's like the carbon footprint on just recycling them alone is, is so huge. And then to use them as the substrate for this next generation of oysters that will clean the water, provide habitat for other species and actually, you know, uh, attenuate storm surges. It's like the best deal. So Billion Oyster Project, uh, I love, I'm a huge fan, if that's not already clear. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing amazing work and it's like great education, access to maritime uh, education for kids in the city. Like they're the best, they're the best. If you can't, that's awesome. As I said, yeah. we're, it's an organization that's yeah. near and dear to us. Yeah, yeah, Bridge Park some plaques all over the well. park. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a few more questions coming in. Um, are the harbor seals at Swinburne Island a discrete colony, or are they migratory animals with the population changing year to year? Uh, that's a question coming from Nancy. I think that they're like a permanent. Yeah, I think they're like that's their spot, and I, like. Uh, the whales are, are somewhat migratory. I don't know about the dolphins, but like the whales are supposed to kind of hue to a like April to November schedule. But incidentally, the whales that went all the way up to the Upper West Side, uh, that was a December occurrence. And I think that one that was by the Staten Island Ferry and the Statue of Liberty 
uh, with Brooklyn Bridge Park, and that was in December too. So that's all obviously you know fluid. But um, I think the seals at Swinburne are a, uh, a year-round thing. Haley wants to know if there's any signage around Staten Island about not disturbing the seals or indicating that there's seals off the coast there. And if not, do you think it's needed? Well, it's I. Uh, I think it probably. I think in general everyone needs to be reminded to like not bother wildlife. This is a big situation with coyotes, which we, are, which we have a great, bigger than you would guess coyote population in New York City. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a lot of incidences. Um, and that's hopefully because people are not bothering coyotes, but also because coyotes avoid people. And it's like, but in general, like we don't want to mess with any wildlife. And I think the reason why Swinburne works uh, better than the Rockaways or Breezy Point or, or, um, Mount Loretto, which would in Staten Island, which would have seals, by the way. I think the reason Swinburne works so well is there's no people there. There's no barking dogs. You know, yeah. um, that's one of the reasons why um, Greenwood Cemetery is so great for birds because nobody lives there. You know, it's just right. a bunch of dead people. So it's and there's other reasons why Greenwood Cemetery is, is very uh, is a very good uh, bird uh, uh, birding location. But part of it, is, especially with the monk parents, is because there's no one there to complain. You know. Um, yeah. I just want to check in with the audience again and invite anybody if you're interested in asking a question directly to Thomas. Uh, you're more than welcome to. You can again just use the raise hand feature in uh, in Zoom. We will look out for your raised hand. Um, we're also Nanette is asking if uh, mammals enter the harbor like seals, dolphins, whales. Uh, is there any trouble with them leaving? Uh, and kind of a follow-up to that is Erica is asking, is there any known impact on the wildlife with the investments in the boat and ferry traffic that we've seen increase uh, around the city in the last few years? Like the New York City ferry system? I, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. And that, you know, it's funny because that ferry system was just basically going between Dumbo and the UN for a long time. And now it's going up to Mott Haven. It's going to Soundview. It's going out to St. George. It's going to, yeah. So the ferries, the ferries are expanding in a big way as well. Um, I haven't heard, I haven't heard, uh, the, I like the ferry, but it is sort of a financial boondoggle in some ways. So I think if anything did happen, the New York post would probably be like, Hey, the Blasio's ferries killed the whale. I mean, you could just like, they would, they're probably like have that headline saved, you know, uh, for if that does happen. So I, I think we would hear about it. Uh, my hope is that the, I think the ferries are, I like the ferries, but, um, I live in Dumbo, so it's, 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 it's easy for me to use them. But, uh, you hope that it's like another way for people to kind of uh, experience the water and, you know, be aware of the water more than you would be on the F train, you know? Um, and uh, maybe that's an, another way for people to get involved and, and take care of the water. You know, you, you hope that that uh, mitigates any like collisions <laughs> or that, you know, who knows, but um, yeah, I haven't heard of anything yet. I see a couple of people have come on camera, so I want to invite them to ask your question. Uh, I see Richard is is the first person I can see. Richard, thanks for for coming forth. Oh, listen, uh, thank you guys for organizing this. This is wonderful. Um, please call me Rick uh, Thomas. Uh, listen, whoever is putting flyers <laughs> for your book around the uh, Vinegar Hill Dumbo area, you know Maybe. that's why I have a copy. So thank oh, you cool. for that. Oh, cool. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really like the way you handled uh, invasive species. Well, invasive is kind of a loaded term, uh, native and non-native species. And I was wondering, just because as much as it's great that New York is rewilding in so many respects, we are so far gone from what we used to be. I was wondering if you found from a conservation standpoint that we're a little more open to things like starlings or cats or other animals existing as a wild part of our lives. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a, yeah, that's a, I'm glad you liked the posters. Uh, uh, and, uh, that's a great question. The invasive species, I think there's two ways to look at this or there's a, a lot of ways, to look at it, but like, we don't really need rats. Um, you know, I, I have respect for rats and I think that like, I ultimately think that rats are around because we don't take care of our trash. So like, it's not really the rat's fault. It's kind of our fault that there are rats. Um, I really love pigeons. I think pigeons um, are an invasive species and there are probably too many of them, but the peregrine falcon uh, has been, is native to New York, has been a conservation success story. 
and is thriving in New York City, partly because there are so many pigeons to eat, you know? And so that's a good thing. Um, the coyote is um, sort of filling the niche that the wolf and the bear would have done. You know, it's sort of the, the biggest apex predator that we can kind of manage in New York City. So that's, so they're, they're, they're providing these really important ecological functions. Um, starlings, I guess, are too, um, but like, bed bugs and roaches like i don't i don't know that we need those you know like and i think that roaches uh especially can, i think cause a lot of health problems and rats do too so i, I think that um it depends yeah <laughs> for lack of a better term it depends yeah. like better answer we do have a couple more questions in the chat uh vera vera are you interested in asking thomas a question Maybe not, we can come back to Vera. Uh, Dale, I see you have your camera on. Weissman. Hi there, if you're interested in asking Thomas a question, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Well, I already asked the first question about um, getting notified when there is wildlife in New York well, thank Harbor. You. Unfortunately, my camera went off around that time, so I missed some of it but I got the Gotham site and the Twitter, just Thomas talking about Twitter. Yeah, I, I would say following like Gotham Whale or, um, you know, there are other, there's Wild New York, uh, you know, bird alerts. I mean, you can, and then once you start following one, they'll recommend others like them, you know? And I think um, Th th those because those really happen so quickly you know like a whale may only spend an hour in the harbor and then you have like this flash of people kind of excited about it and then you know it's kind of over but um i have yeah i kept looking for the yeah. seal i i i follow heather wolf's yep um instagram account really and good. i ran out to look for the seal and i could yeah. never find it <laughs> yeah the uh was, i saw a bald eagle in manhattan a couple of years ago in riverside park and it was because of twitter i mean that's how it you know i didn't i wouldn't know any and not only that but like when uh the other kind of secret i have to birding is like look for other birders like you'll never find the bird <laughs> you'll look for the person with the huge telescope <laughs> who's like, you're like oh it's right there you know like I, I i just my own that's been helpful to me but but you know the something like a bald eagle or the mandarin duck or or even the um the snowy owl that was in central park last year which was so exciting um you know twitter painted is bunting the painted in bunting in Preston yeah, park. Yep. that's right that's right and i mentioned that actually yeah i mentioned that in the book um there are these celebrity birds and i guess uh the bald eagle in central park is the new one but um it, it, you know obviously like social media has a lot of negative connotations that's very well earned but in, in these in these sort of narrow application you really can get a good sense of what's happening uh in in, in quick real time so worth it worth thanks a look. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much thank you everybody for your questions uh thank you everybody for joining us tonight i think we're gonna wrap up thomas thank you so much it was oh really gosh. such a pleasure to talk with you tonight this was so great it was so great and uh thank you all for being here uh again it's wild city uh I um I'm so thrilled to be doing this with Broken Bridge Park, one of my favorite places in the world, not just in New York City. So thank you so much. Yeah, I'd really love to encourage everybody still with us to check out uh, Thomas's book, Wild City: A Brief History of New York and Forty Animals, uh, available on his website, uh, thomasheinsbooks.com, as well as your local bookstore, uh, as well as join the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy for fun, family-friendly activities and learning experiences at our Environmental Education Center in Dumbo. We have open hours Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And the theme this month of January is woodlands and mammals. Uh, so we have a few more chances to visit us this month to learn about the city's land mammals. Uh, next month, we're looking forward to a brand new room theme about geology, as well as some accompanying virtual programs such as this. Uh, we'll have a geology talk for children on February 2nd. To learn more, you can visit brooklynbridgepark.org slash education. Uh, we've included links to these chats as well. There are several other exciting conservancy events in the working. Please stay tuned. Uh, we really look forward to seeing you. And once again, please check out Thomas's book, Wild City. Thank you again all for coming. Thank you again, Thomas. Thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank you.
Good night, everybody.